production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, we visit with a designer and craftsman who treasures the materials that he uses in his creations. Meet a painter who draws his inspiration from a more traditional craft, and listen to the unique sounds of a band with lots of energy. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Tobias Katz is a designer and craftsman based in Columbus who uses his industrial and interior design degree to create bespoke furniture. In line with his philosophy, his creations have clean lines and are made to last. We recently visited his home and studio where he shared a few of his custom pieces and deep knowledge of materials and construction processes. In college I had this great professor who taught furniture. He had this message I really took to heart that anything you make should last longer than it took the material to grow. When I work with wood it's really glaringly obvious how old something is. So you start to look at some of these boards and these things that I'm using and they're hundred year old trees and as a designer and a builder, I try to take responsibility to make my pieces, both aesthetically and physically, be able to last in someone's space that long. I am a Eastern Nordic influenced minimalist, and my work reflects that, but you know, there's no reason why these pieces couldn't live in other countries or other places. My name is Tobias Sagan Katz, and I'm an artist, a designer, a builder, a maker, a creative person. I remember when I was a little kid, I used to love to crawl under tables and look at how they were created. I was obsessed with my grandparents' leaved dining table because you could stretch a table, and it blew my mind. Furniture is so personal. Most all of my pieces are created with someone in mind. I found that people wanted to be a part of the process, and so once we get a design finished in the computer, I make a scale model of the piece in the true wood that it's ultimately going to be, and I give it to the person. They're able to, you know, hold it in far view and look at it sort of where it should be uh, in the space to see if they like it. And it allows them to start to see some of the details that I'm thinking through before they're even in place. My work is not uh, mass produced. It's not readily available at stores. And it also takes me a while. I use a combination of hand tools and machinery to optimize my workflow. Not necessarily because one is better than the other, but it, sometimes it's just the best tool for the job. For some of my pieces, I do joinery methods that are 500 to 1,000 years old and some that were only created using a tool that they made 10 years ago. And I try to look at and use materials important to the region. We are really fortunate to live in Ohio where we have a great collection of lumber yards here. And I source most all of my wood from locally grown and sustainably harvest farms that truly care. I generally work with lighter toned woods. Most of the pieces that I do are in ash or white oak. 
both due to aesthetics, but also due to the type of work that I do. They're both hardwoods, they're both easy to um, steam, to cut, to shave. The way that the wood is oriented creates a visual aesthetic in the piece. I love to use uh, what's called quarter sawn or rift sawn wood, which is where they cut the board at an angle in the grain line so that you have really tight, long grain throughout and you get this really beautiful pinstriping effect. And that then has a ton of hard grain, so it makes a really structural surface. So for desks, I love to use quarter sawn because if you're gonna write on it all the time, that gives you a good deflectionary surface, but also a really nice, pleasing line to look at. With a larger piece, I like to incorporate the lines of the wood as the tree would grow. For larger surfaces, I'll use the flat sawn bit, but then throughout different details, I can use quarter sawn elements that then create a pop. I am very guilty of the fact and the saying, uh, uh, cobbler's children have no shoes. My partner Gail has been very patient and flexible with me. This is a, a labor of love between the two of us and between our evolving aesthetic. All of these pieces are created through the nine years we've been together. And some were created as gifts from me to her that she had no say in. And some were created that were collaborations where we worked together from initial conception to delivery day. As I look at furniture, everything should have function and space is always at a premium and making things that both fit for how I live and how my clients live is one of my favorite parts about furniture. You know, they sort of say that a designer doesn't hit their stride till their 60s or 70s. And so I have so much time to look forward to what I'll create. The aesthetic I'm creating makes me happy and it doesn't have to be everybody's, but I am always flattered when somebody wants one of my pieces and I'm extremely flattered when someone gives me open creative interpretation and as I've gotten older and my practice has grown I've gotten more of that. As a designer and artist that's the most flattering thing when uh, somebody who's not family or somebody who is a stranger um, trusts my vision to create something that they'll live with for decades. To see more of his amazing creations, check him out online at TobiasCats.com. Next, we travel to Oklahoma to meet painter Jason Wilson. Inspired by his grandmother's quilts, Jason rethinks and revives this traditional art form. Let's learn more about his journey. When I create my paintings, I want them to be perfect. I want there to be no distractions. I want the edges to be really hard edged. I don't want you to see paintbrush strokes. I want it to be so clean and so precise that it's just like, wow, that's a paint. I'm Jason Wilson. I have uh, been an art teacher in the state of Oklahoma uh, for 31 years. I'm now a professional artist trying to be and uh, see what happens with that. I'm known kind of as a, a painter of quilts. I embrace that. I think it's part of the legacy that I hope to leave. I've always had art in my life. Growing up as a child, I remember going to my grandma's house. The quilts would be hanging uh, from, the, from the ceiling. And I used to be fascinated with the designs and the patterns in those quilts and especially the 3D ones. Well, Wilson uh, was my great-grandma. She was in the paper a lot for her quilts. She made quilts for 
uh, several of the Democratic uh, presidents and governors, but only the Democrat. She was quite a character. She'd tell you exactly what she thought. This quilt's at least 55 years old, and, uh, and it was made by Ma Wilson. Why do I keep the quilts that I have from my grandmas? I cherish those because now they become a part of me because of the art that I have developed out of the style of seeing and being inspired by their quilts. When I start a painting of my traditional style, I will draw it to scale on a piece of grid paper. It kind of goes back to the technique in quilting where they did quiltings by blocks. But I do it on grid paper. Then I get the canvas and I start braining that up to the canvas. It has to be so precise because if you, if you get it off, lines won't match. I had my students through the years would tell me, Mr. Wilson, that's cheating. You're using tape. I can do that. And I'd say, here, go do it. About two days later, they'd bring it back up. Okay, Mr. Wilson, you can do that. I can't quite handle it. <laughs> It took me years to discover this, to figure it out. You know, this brush here was the big secret because I learned to varnish those edges, basically. I decide the colors after I have the uh, grid drawing. I will draw it to the canvas and then I will set it aside and I may wait three, four weeks before I start because I'm trying to figure out the color scheme. And it's weird because then you start painting in your head at night. And so those colors end up kind of coming from your dreams because you go to sleep and you're dreaming about this piece. And those colors sometimes end up being the colors that you use in the actual painting. It's tedious, but I enjoy it, but <laughs> not everybody does, so. A lot of times people think that it's computer generated, and uh, sometimes they think that insults me, but to me, I, that's a compliment that I can, I can get it that clean. That's the part that scared me the most after the wreck. In October, October the 7th, I was in a very serious car accident. I was on my way to work and uh, I was in head-on collision. I had three fractured ribs, a uh, fractured sternum, a severe head injury with a severe concussion. My ankle was bent completely in two and crushed. I was scared that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to return to what I loved. In this world, we can't control anything. It's just chaotic. But when I am creating that painting, that's the one thing I can't control. I remember going into the dining room and sitting down and developing a grid painting because I wanted to know that I could still come up with an idea. So I sat down and I drew this piece out uh, on the grid paper and it, it ended up being the first painting completed after the wreck. It's called Fractured. I know that some of my paintings are very busy and they can, that can be part of the reaction they provoke. I think a lot of my art does need to be seen from a distance because from a distance is when that visual movement happens. 
This kind of goes back to the perceptual art. People see what they want to see in it. Sometimes the ones that I think are, are oh, I don't like that, the first ones to sell <laughs> because somebody else will see it and they love it. Saying it makes it um, look like it has uh, several more layers rather than. I had always thought, well, I've, I'm, I'm doing art inspired by my grandma's and great-grandma's quilts and the patterns I see of other quilts. And I wanted to bring together a group of professional quilters who would take the paintings that I had painted inspired by quilts and then they would do quilts inspired by those paintings. And so I've been dreaming about this for a long time. And so I put a, a deal on Facebook. If you're a professional quilter and you're interested in, in going down this journey together where you're doing quilts inspired by my paintings and I'm doing paintings inspired by your quilts, just let me know. I was wondering who is this person? So I looked him up and when I saw his paintings, I knew right away I wanted to make quilts based on his paintings. I just kind of went gaga. I led issues of color. I really like the strong gap geometric sense that I had. And said, oh my gosh, he, this guy is basically just uh, painting quilts. It is a neat group of people because all seven of them are different. And that's what I wanted. Quaint is Q U for quilting, and the ain't part is for painting. We don't copy it, we just do an interpretation of, of this painting. Well, I took the, the basic components he had here of the stripes and the crossbars. I wanted to, with this piece, show not only what was going on, but highlights and, and darkness. So the Boom Pow came from an actual comic book, but also the, the way that this, this uh, uh, drawings are put together is very much what you would see in a graffiti out in the street. We've been calling it the Invasion Quilt. As soon as I saw this, because I was like, oh, I don't know what to do, and then I saw that, and I was just like, that's it. And um, it was just like, it's like a spider bot. I think if Maul Wilson come in here, she would be astounded at the colors. People always already look at painting as a fine art, and we'd like to see them see quilting more as a fine art and not just a craft. The people who put those together really took the time to think about how the colors work together, how the patterns work together, and to create something beautiful. We hope that they'll see on the wall how beautiful they are together, maybe to make people look a little closer. We might just step up and, and show Oklahoma, first of all, show the United States, and hey, you know, show the world what uh, the Midwestern art quilts and, and art can be like. I haven't seen anything like Quaint yet, and I think that's pretty good because I think it's going to give us a, something unique to offer the, the art world. This is kind of a, just a, a dream come true, to be honest with you, that we finally have got to this point. And I look forward to continuing because we still want to go further. I often think, what would my grandmas think about this? I think that they would enjoy seeing what I've done, and I hope they would be proud of what I've accomplished. Now I'm in national shows. I'm in several publications. I've been in my first book I was published in this year. Uh, it's just, it blows my mind where I've gone since 2014. It just amazes me that, that the journey has been as successful as it has been. 
and I'm enjoying every second of it. I love it. To see more, check him out at artbyjasonwilson.com. Speak Seldom is a band that likes to describe themselves as a bunch of people making noise, but we found them to be so much more. They visited us in the studio and recorded a couple of their unique songs. Let's take a listen. To hear more, find them on Facebook or Instagram at Speak Seldom Music. Well, that's our show. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. Steaming is 
Cause I've been driving all night for the weekend Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com.